There we are. Good to see you, Richard. Yeah. Hello again. Nice to see you. You've yeah. been on a trip somewhere, yeah? Yes, yes, around Europe, and I'm now somewhere in been in various different parts of England and Wales. And at the moment, I'm in a friend's house in Wales. So there we are. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yes, since we last spoke, um, Michael, I've seen that very interesting talk between Matt Siegel and yourself. Mm. And I was I was very taken by it. I'm, I'm a great admirer of Matt and mm. share much of his philosophical stance. Mm. Mm. And I, I wanted to come back to the question of... Um, the nature of form, really, which is, seems to me the centrally interesting uh, undecided element here in in developmental biology. How is it that um, antlers know the, the pattern to regenerate? How is it that the, the morphogenesis of the skull of a frog knows that it's going in the wrong direction, corrects itself? Where is that knowledge or memory stored? And above all, where is the knowledge and memory of the human brain's massively complex structures stored. It's clearly not in the DNA string and you yourself have demonstrated there's no near enough information. So what are we talking about and where is this? Is, is there a, a field we, in physics now, one's continually talking not so much about matter and, and so on, but about fields and f forces of energy. So uh, do you think that's a way of looking at what we're talking about here? Yeah, I mean, I, so, so I think we could address this in two ways. I, I could certainly tell you stories about the mechanistic uh, medium in which I think this information is held. And, we, you know, fun, funny enough, although I started out by reading uh, Harold Burr and, and people like that who really thought of bioelectricity as fields. And he was, you know, Burr, Burr who was uh, pr very prescient and right about many things back in the 30s, felt very strongly that we should be using field um, models instead of charge models. And so, so, so I, you know, sort of that's my uh, the origin story there on, on bioelectricity. But despite that, we haven't really done anything with fields yet. So everything that I've done so far has been on uh, patterns of uh, spatial patterns of um, static voltage gradients. So, yeah. um, so we haven't really done fields, but people like uh, Earl Miller at MIT, who's done some amazing work on recasting uh, the way that neuroscientists think about what's happening in neural networks, recasting them as a field phenomenon. Um, I think something like that is certainly possible for us. And so, so we, we actually have a project uh, starting to do that. Um, a postdoc in my lab and I are doing that. But, but regardless, you know, whether, whether field or, or more classic kinds of things, um, we can certainly talk about um, what I think is the medium that, that holds these uh, um, set points for, for anatomical homeostasis. But I think there's an even deeper, and so we can do that, but I think there's an even deeper question here, which is, what does it mean, both in the cognitive sense and in the morphological sense, for information to be, for, for that information to be somewhere? You know, when people ask, where is it? Um, I, I'm, I'm not even sure, I, I don't know what the correct shape of the answer to that looks like anymore. Uh, because anyway, so that's, that's something we could, we could discuss as well, because in, increasingly that doesn't seem to me as, as the right uh, formalism for that, um, for, that, for that question, you know? No, I see that, but um, we don't have a formula for things that are um, non-spatially <laughs> located. We have to accept that certain things like consciousness can't be spatially located, although people like Mark Soames thinks that he can locate it in the brain, which is a, another question. But we can't see where consciousness itself is located. It's the wrong question to ask about it. But nonetheless, we have to be able to deal with this idea of form fields that have very strong interactions with information that we can more sp clearly specify where it is and mm. how, how it's accessed, but we mm. don't have any clue about where or how the information about form is even stored, never mind sort of where it is in a more profound sense. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and, and I think it really matters for, for many reasons. One is, like, I can certainly tell a story about a, a bioelectric network that 
holds the memory to which the cells are going to build if it's injured or even in basic development. So, I mean, we can see it now. We can visualize this, this, this uh, information structure. We can read and write into it so we can modify it. The cells will build something different if we change it. So, I, we're beginning, and again, Burr all of this in the 30s. He proposed this, and then I mean, he was right. Like, we, we, can, we can see all of that. But to me, what's now becoming even more interesting is that we see that around that, there is a kind of a, a weird kind of um, almost latent space of possibilities that you normally never observe until you perturb the system in a particular way, until you take the way the cells and they make a xenobot or the, the wasp comes and prompts a bunch of uh, uh, oak leaf cells to make this crazy spiky gall thing. Uh, you wouldn't know that those things are in the possible space of these cells. They're, it's nowhere in the pattern that we would read out normally during normals, right? And so, so I'm now really interested in addition to the mechanism, I, I view all of these model systems now as, as telescopes that let us peer into this weird invisible latent space. You know, the Xenobot and I mean, I guess everything is a kind of device for asking what else is in that space, what's possible. You know, you start with a little keyhole through which you see a tadpole or an oak leaf, and that, that's all you see, right? But, but around it, we now know is all this other stuff. And, and I'm really interested in, without being able to, this is what Matt and I talked about, you know, I, I certainly can't say where it is. It's wherever the truths of mathematics are, right? I, I guess, I, I don't know. But would you accept that there's a difference between being able to upset um, by intervening in some way to upset a form without knowing in other words, how to how to make the form not happen, but we, we don't, that doesn't tell us how the form normally does happen, if you see what I mean. It, it's like being able to intervene in a very complex system at a certain point in um, a serial pathway of um, causation, and you can intervene somewhere, you can see a mechanism, you can intervene in it, and you can uh, create a possibly predictable result. But unfortunately, that doesn't help you understand the whole complex system. It just tells you that you can you can wreck it in some way by, <laughs> or change yeah. it for better by interfering in it. Yeah. And so there's a difference between knowing that we can interfere in it and knowing how it's actually working when it's working properly. Yes, although I see it as a continuum because, for example, we can do things with a tadpole tail and head that definitely wreck it as far as a standard Xenopus Lavis tadpole is concerned. That's simply not correct. It's a birth defect, as it were. But actually, it's perfectly correct for a different species of frog. It starts to look like a different, an entirely different species of frog. And for that species of frog, it's not a defect at all. It's exactly what it's supposed to be. And so, right? And so, and so there are certain things you can do that are absolutely, you would, you would put it in the bucket of wrecking it for sure. But there are other influences that are not so much wrecking it, but they're sort of going in a different region of that space that would have been perfectly fine if that had happened, uh, you know, on, the, on its own, right? So there are... It sounds like you're suggesting that there is a a field of form for some other frog that if you divert the field of form for this frog it will switch over to the other one as though it's sitting there waiting in in potentia I, I, yeah yeah i don't you know as much as uh, you know molecular biologists would would say this is a crazy talk i i i'm starting to think that that's exactly what it is and funny enough darcy thompson right in his classic in his uh, what yeah. 41 classic uh or so uh growth and form he had these i think one of the most my favorite part of that book are these four or five pages where he he takes existing creatures and he puts them on a grid on a on a you know on math, what they call math paper here right and then he stretches the grid in various weird ways and what you get are these distorted things that are a completely different species of, 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 I know, you know, he's got crabs and fish and, and whatnot. Right. Yeah. And so I think he was on to, I mean, you know, you didn't have the language of attractors and stuff like that yet, but I, I think he was on to this, this yeah. idea. So does the, does the, the language ironically of um, competence and performance, the linguistic language sense help here? So when we think about uh, sentences that are well formed grammatically but have never been uttered before, mm -hmm. I think we're in that sort of territory, right? So there are there's a deep structure to the kinds of things that can be built out of developmental processes, and if you perturb them, it's not just broken or spoiled. It's like okay, I'll say something else. 
but the something else is the what's what's the closest thing I can say semantically but still grammatically mm. correct given the language of things that are possible. Mm -hmm. Take the instance though of um, cutting off um, a set of antlers um, or just one of the antlers from a stag and that stag has a, a unique um, formation in the cross sections of that antler and it will be reproduced by whatever grows back so to go a step back behind what you're saying where is the sentence as it were the the right formed sentence where is that information can you say that yeah i mean well, this, this the story with the antlers is even is even uh, more disturbing than that right because of the the trophic memory business that if you if you and I have these antlers in my lab, actually, the guy Bubenik who did all this stuff, he, he he and his son did this work for I think almost sixty years together, and they and they sent me, uh, you know, he's retired now. He sent me all the antlers, so I've got them. I've had them CT scanned and everything. It's it's crazy. They they're all labeled with the name of the deer, and you know, a, a 1981, 82, 83, 84. So what you do is um, you make a you make a cut at, in the in the antler, and it grows a little bone callus and it heals, and then the whole thing falls off, right? And next year, and for the next five or six years, when the new antlers come out, it has an ectopic branch point at the location that you injured it last year. So not only is that a memory, but it learns. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a labile memory, and then it goes away. Then it gets progressively smaller, and it goes away. And so what, you know, just, just, just think about it. I remember reading this and thinking about what would a molecular biological model of this look like where the cells in the scalp have to store for months this idea that, okay, well, you know, three steps to the left, ah, no, there's an extra thing there. And then I keep going sort of, right? So if you're thinking about local rules and, you know, like cellular automata kind of stuff, you, it, you have to be able to work it backwards and to say, what should the rules be to give me an extra thing in the portrait? And it keeps that memory. I mean, it's a very, yeah, I think the Andler thing is, is, is a really profound example. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, I'm not sure <laughs> that we can, we can, I, I just want to keep it in mind because it's easy to, <clears throat> to feel that one, it's rather like the hard question and the soft question, if you see what I mean. And what I think Mark Soames does is answer the soft question. He thinks he can point to a place in the brain where consciousness originates. Or consciousness is most centered. Um, the neural correlates, as they say. Sorry about that. The neural correlates, as they say. The neural correlates. But that's the soft question. The hard question is, but where does consciousness come from? How does it arise and what is it? And and I think the same thing can happen in our discussions. And we can say, well, I can specify a mechanism whereby this thing can correct itself or whatever. But we, where is the plan according to which it's correcting itself? That's the, the thing. That's, because it's certainly not in the in the, in anything that we've looked at so far it's, it's you know as michael to his credit has, has has demonstrated there's just nothing like the amount of information that could conceivably be needed and when you consider that whatever it is during certain periods of gestation up to five um hundred thousand brain cells are being generated every minute but they've got to not just be a massive brain cells they've got to be forming themselves into the brain with all its immensely complex and minutely important uh, elements in in their correct place and I, I, you know, the question still remains for me unless you can illuminate it either of you what on earth are we talking about here what, 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 where is this what is it that how does it know as it were what's going on mm -hmm. where is it so uh I've been thinking about that with Mike and uh, as one word, if you have more than one conversation with Mike and um, I've been developing a, mm, an idea, a theory, a vision, a, a man, possibly just an analogy about how that might work, but it hasn't had many outings yet. And I don't know if um <laughs> I don't know if I'll be able to get it out in a way which makes any sense to you, but I wouldn't mind having a go if you're interested. Cool. So I've been thinking about um, a metaphor that's a sort of um, a deeper, a deeper concept of the music of life where information is held 
in a way which in a in a thing in a way uh, that you might call a song and a song is something that's kind of um in between uh language and a vibration which actually does mechanical work okay. so with language you kind of think well yeah that's okay you could write something down but i still need an interpreter the words themselves don't do any work right but with a song um you have the idea that a that a note is actually a vibration which is capable of doing physical work by moving other resonators which are um of a similar frequency or of a harmonic frequency now you know one note on its own isn't going to hold much information but uh when you think about a stack of uh harmonic frequencies from one octave to the other uh they can hold much more information um because of the way in which they uh stack on top of each other and um do um uh phase locking each time you each time you double the frequency there's two you double mm -hmm. the number of ways in which the phase locking can occur okay yes um now the high frequencies are need must live in small physical scales and the low frequencies live in larger physical scales and the various dynamical systems of uh, an organism's body from molecular vibrations to gene regulatory cycles to uh, cytoplasmic flows to cellular metabolic dynamics to tissue bioelectric dynamics to larger and larger scales all of these dynamics are not a one-way decoding but uh, a dynamical vibration and yeah. some of them are mechanical and some of them are electrical and some of them are chemical uh, but they are all thanks darling they're all uh, interlocked in a way which um registers with the scale above and the scale below because there's a harmonic um phase locking but also in a way which is labile that oh it could lock this way and it could lock that way right so mm -hmm. that it becomes productive like a language does that there's a deep structure to the utterances that can be held in such a structure mm -hmm. uh and a song can be transferred from one suitably irritable substrate to another uh, you can put the same song at one physical scale into another physical scale by changing the octave and it's still the same song mm -hmm. you change you know the a g is still a g as you as you change the scales up mm -hmm. and that means that the kind of combination of harmonics that you have in the particular shape of an antler where there are bioelectric vibrations moving around that shape where the shape controls the the combination of harmonics that live happily in that antler like a combination of harmonics that live in a tuning fork um that combination of harmonics can also be can also resonate with a, a combination of harmonics that sings the same song in a gene regulatory network or sings the same song in uh, a neural network that it, it's those different there's a substrate independence of those combinations of harmonics that enables the song to move about from one scale to another and one tissue to another and one substrate to another and it's the song that is inherited through uh evolutionary lineages and the genes oh. the, the genes play a part of that but the cell plays a part of that and the heritable environment plays a part of that uh all of those different scales set up um the the material substrate but also the dynamical properties because the material substrate and the dynamical properties are co-creating one another right that the mm -hmm. there's the fast scales the fast time scales we think of dynamics which are controlled by parameters of the slow scales but the slow scales are not really parameters because they're also variables changing on a slower scale and, and held in larger physical media or slower physical media um 
So I think about answers. I've been thinking about answers to questions mm. like the ones you were asking in those terms. Mm. That, a, mm. that a song is is not just informational, but it's also something that does something that does that has causal power in the world. It doesn't need a decoder. It just is. Um, yes, but if if the analogy and I like the analogy uh, to 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 a great extent, and how how you know. Uh, as it were, where is the memory of it? So, for example, I, you know, play a certain piece of music by Bach, um, and then somebody else is able to know what that music is because it's written down on a score. But where is this information of the song, the, the memory of it? I think the, the, the concept of memory comes in rather importantly here because we're talking about an evolving pattern which somehow knows about its past and its future. Well, memory is not that difficult. Um, so it's any substrate which is plastic, when it gets pushed, stays like that. And there are all sorts of plasticities at all sorts of physical scales. But the, um, you know, obviously one important question is what's the relationship to the genetic information? And I've been thinking about that in with a particular sound sound phenomenon um which is called cladney plates do you know how they work please explain so uh cladney played around with squares of metal and circles of metal which he would bow with the, the edge of the plate with a they held supported in the middle on a post and bow the edge of it with a violin bow and then sprinkle salt or sand on the metal. Oh, plate. yes, yes. Yeah, I'm familiar with this. Yes, mm. yes. So and um, striking and beautiful, actually. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So the, the modes that fit in a geometry um, mm. reveal uh, the dynamics which are in that particular structure. Yeah. And the modes are in part determined by the geometry of the plate and in part determined by the frequency with which it's vibrated. Yeah. And if the sand was a bit heavier, it would be in part determined by the memory of the note that it had just been played. Yeah, okay. So uh, the experiment is designed that the sand is supposed to be just a way of reading the vibrations, but it doesn't actually alter them. It doesn't interfere with them. But it's not... I don't think it's too much of a stretch to imagine that it does interfere with them, that the position of the sand holds a little bit of memory in the plate that makes it more likely to adopt one mode than another, just because that's the mode that was held previously. But as soon as a new vibration was set up, all that would be lost. Yes. If you assume that the vibration is driven rather than sung, if the if the vibration was itself the dynamics of the plate in interaction with the dynamics of other physical scales, then the song both creates the structure and is affected by the structure. It's kind of like when you when you put two metronomes that are out of phase on a shared wobbly board, right, and they lock up with each other. They lock up, yeah. But which which one which one was in charge? Did the one on the left did do what the one on the right said, or did the one on the right do what the one on the left said? Right. Of course, that's the wrong question, isn't it? <laughs> mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, because it's so a they're, they're dynamic, dynamic system. Yeah, yeah. But dynamic systems are always are always changing and if you want something that is constantly repeated you you have to have a way of knowing how to hold things sufficiently stable for this this familiar pattern to be expressed again it seems to me otherwise you'd find something else altogether happening but we're concerned with the extraordinary consistency of enormously complex forms in three dimensions where exactly i mean a song is a lovely idea but it's also only by a stretch of the imagination is it able to store three-dimensional information oh i don't think that's the case uh so the combination the combination so a, a particular frequency lives naturally on a string of a particular length 
but I don't think it's too much of a stretch to go from a combination of frequencies defining a two-dimensional shape and a chord of more notes defining a three-dimensional shape, that the combination of geometries, particular combinations of geometries, won't fit in a one-dimensional orbit, but they'll fit in a two- or three-dimensional orbit. They can be notated in, a, in an entirely two-dimensional plane, and as long as you repeat whatever it is that's inscribed on that piece of paper. In other words, information has two-dimensional instructions, but it can't, how can this sort of thing describe the structure of the skull of a frog? Mm. I wonder if I could uh, find that little illustration that I showed you, Mike, it might be useful. Do you want to chip in a bit whilst I see if I can find it? Sure, yeah, I mean, one, one intuition pump for these things, and I'm in no way suggesting that these things are properly captured by the model of cellular automata. But if you if you think about cellular automata, like the game of the classic game of life, right, where the genetics of each cell is a very simple rule that counts neighbors, and depending on that, it will either be on or off in the next generation. That's it. That's all it has. So, so on a reductionist sort of on a, on a really reductionist level, there's nothing else. You can see all the rules. There's no magic in that world. And then if you run this, what happens is that uh, our visual system inspecting this world sees things like gliders, right? So you see these patterns that are moving. And if you take them seriously, you can do things like, like um, build uh, touring machines in that world that, that use gliders as, as uh, bit, you know, bit streams and things like this, right? Uh, and so on. And so now these gliders have an angle at which they move through the plane and they have a speed at which they move through the plane. And so one could ask, where in the uh, in the genetics and physics of that environment is the speed and, and angle of motion of these things recorded? Like, where is that set? And you'll never find it because it isn't, the rules don't say anything about gliders, right? It's in a, the glide, in fact, according at, much like with everything else that we're interested in here at the reductionist level, they don't exist. There aren't any gliders. Mm. But of course, if you don't believe in gliders, you miss out on quite a bit because you, can know, you can't engineer the, the way that somebody who believes in gliders could. But but as soon as you accept their, that they exist in some useful fashion, you face this insolvable problem of, but they move at, I forget what it is, is it 45 degrees or 35 or something? I forget what it is. But they move at this particular, at, at a very characteristic angle. And so it's it's sort of like pi in our world or E or these other, you know, these constants that just sort of show up and, and you know, and, 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 and where are they recorded, right? Ooh. So I, I always kind of come back to the same thing. I really feel like the same thing that... Uh, allows the evolution to save all kinds of effort when it's evolving a triangle all it has to do is get the first two angles it doesn't need to evolve the third one you get the yeah. third for free right <laughs> and so and so i feel like that's you know that's a free gift and so i feel like there there is an important sense in which biology by taking advantage what loosely said said, said very roughly what i think biology is doing is figuring out um uh pointers into this space, prompts or pointers into this enormous space of possibilities, which I think exists in the same way that, you know, people make, um, you know, have you ever seen people make these maps of mathematics, right? And so you got, you know, number theory over here, and then next to it is some other thing, and, you know, I, I feel like this is not made up. I think, uh, you know, and, and some people agree, I think Penrose would agree with this, that, that, that these things are out there in some important way. And I don't think biology has to invent everything from scratch by, by searching them, you know, this kind of micro, very difficult micro space of all the things you have to do, I think, you yeah. know. But, but I mean, two things occur to me there. One is that that's a step forward in itself, because you're saying that rather as in the way there are sort of pretty much eternal forms of things like pi and the triangle and so forth, there are somewhere forms when we can't say where those are, and we can't say where the biological ones are either is, is that right and and the second thing is that the the analogy with um uh the gliders is slightly different i think from anything that i'm wanting us to focus on because uh, gliders are a kind of illusion within our within our visual system if you like that really behind what we see as a glider there is something else which is not a glider, and that's what you were basically saying. But if we're looking at the structure of a brain, it's not that, you know, you know I just look at the brain and happen to see this complex 
series of ganglia that are perfectly formed and in the right order. Um, that's a kind of visual, perceptual illusion. That it's absolutely real. So, yeah. So, so let me push back on that a little bit because um, something that, uh, so, so and, and, and Josh Bongard and I tried to formalize this a little bit in a recent paper. Um, and, and I think, I think people have said this, you know, um, uh, uh, Don Hoffman would say something like this. I think uh, one way to think about almost anything is as a construction in the mind of some particular observer, Right now, I'm not. I'm not. I'm certainly not going in the way that every every anything goes because I think some constructions are way better than other constructions. Exactly. Right? But but uh, you know, we could. You, you, I'm, I, you, you and I, I'm sure, have had the experience that we can talk to of a physicist who will say, "Brain? What brain? Uh, there's no brain. There's a collection of uh, symmetries of some underlying <laughs> field and some particles. Uh, maybe uh, nowadays, probably not even particles." And, uh, and that's it. And you're making stuff up. All this talk of brains and tabletops and, and even space-time itself, right? Don Hoffman says now that space-time is doomed, according to, I mean, I don't know, but the, but the physicists apparently are not, not into space-time anymore. And so, uh, you know, there certainly are people who would, I think, push back and say, mm -hmm. everything we see is exactly the status of a glider. It is some successful mm -hmm. observer um, putting yes. a, a, a stencil on reality and saying, this is the frame I would like. I want to look at things at this level of organization, not below, not above, and 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 so on. So, you know, I don't, I don't know. Well, I mean, if we're to go there, I, I fairly fundamentally disagree with with Donald Hoffman about this. In a way, it's an old story, which is that it's almost a Kantian vision that really we can't get beyond our perceptions mm -hmm. and that as it were we're inside a windowless room seeing projections on an internal screen or reading out from a dial as he says but I, I don't think that's an adequate description of what happens and it uh, and I've uh, I've written at length about why in the, in the matter with things but I think the, the, the what is mistaken here is something that both Niels Bohr and a and Whitehead pointed out, which is that Bohr said, you know, the trouble is that scientists mistake their model for the reality, whereas all we're trying to do is to make things cohere, but it's not necessarily the reality. And so, although there is a way in which you can conveniently make things cohere, th there is no guarantee that this is a representation of any kind of a reality. Now, that's not saying that there is no reality, that the only reality and the only reality that we can actually have is a model that we've designed and created because there is a whole realm of perception, of emotion, of embodiment, of experience in which we find that certain things are truer, more veridical, more repeatable and so on than others. And so this whole area of experience is ruled out because of using a, a purely cognitive construct of how reality can be or could be thought of. And I think that the, the error is to mistake a, a, a passable model for anything to do with reality. Now, you may say, well, how do you judge what reality is? And that's why as a, a neuroscientist, I begin my inquiry in neuroscience, in which you can see certain things about different parts of the brain and their ability to sustain something that is veridical in any sense that you or I would uh, accept that term, i.e. that if we followed its promptings, we would be less likely to end up in a catastrophe than if we followed another one. So there are realities that are experiential, testable, and you know, to say that we can never be certain of something, we can never perhaps ultimately know it, is not to say that we can't really know what's going on out there, if you see what I mean. We go from, we can't be certain of it, and therefore our minds help to construct it, to it's all constructed by the mind. And I don't like either of these rather naive, in my view, conclusions, a kind of really excessively naive idealism and an excessively naive realism. Either of these is a wrong answer. And it's in a relationship between these things that everything comes into being. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I wonder if... Um, I wonder if it's useful to think about... Um, how one song sees another, how one frequency sees another frequency, right? So if uh, if I'm an oscillator with a particular frequency, 
uh, what kind of influence can I have on other potential oscillators or other 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 dynamical systems? But if they're very if they're a very different frequency from me, then um, there's a sense in which they just can't see me because uh, you know we'll be in phase for just a moment, we'll be out of phase the next moment, and there's there's no stability in our relationship. On the other hand, if um, if we're very similar in frequency, then uh, I turn very slowly compared to them. And if we're identical in frequency, then I stand still, like like, an, like a rotating object in a strobe light. And when I see something with a particular frequency strobe, I see it one way. But when I see that, look, observe that same thing with a different frequency strobe, I can see something else. Uh, and for example, it will also seem stationary if I flash it uh, at half the frequency. And I don't really know whether it's the same frequency as me or whether it's double the frequency of me, because it would seem stationary for both those things. So I'm not really making one observation. I'm not really measuring its rotational speed. I'm only measuring its rotational speed with respect to mine. Now, if I'm not just one frequency, but I'm a whole collection of frequencies, and I'm observing something else, which is a whole collection of frequencies, then some aspects of it will seem stationary, and some aspects of it will seem invisible to me, and other aspects will seem to be, you know, not invisible but rotating quickly. And the ones, the ones which are more like me, are not just things which I can see, but they're things which are actually connected with me, because the phase locking that occurs between us is mutual. That the uh, whenever there's any weak coupling between the systems, it's the coupling that's uh, described by a one-to-one -one ratio or a simple um, harmonic that are the ones which I can see. And the difference between our two songs is also uh, a combination of frequencies in itself, so that our relationship also creates a new song in in our in our relationship to one another so this is a a way of seeing um an observer dependent way of one dynamical system observing another dynamical system without it without it sort of throwing your hands in the air and saying well you could be anything depending on how you look at it yes but then to go back to the musical model um there are obvious ways in which um an octave and um, a fifth uh, relate to, to the notes relate to one another. But there are also um, important things like a diminished seventh <laughs> and other sorts of passing. And Bach is absolutely full of all kinds of colossally different relationships, but they do work together functionally, even though they don't have this uh, like me resonance at all. In fact, they have the opposite of that. So the oh, no, dissonance not, becomes no, part of the resonance. No, that's not true. They do have the like me. So, and you have to put, you have to fill in the rest of the chord in order for the diminished seventh to feel like it's concordant and not discordant. But surely so, that means that all notes in that case. No, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a case of, it's a case of how long is the story I need to tell for you to see that this other note is a harmonic. So when it's the same note or an octave or a fifth, I don't need to tell a big story, right? For the fifth, I only need to go up two octaves and then down a half, and this, and there we are, right? Uh, but for the diminished seventh, there's a there's a bigger there's a longer story that I need to tell you to warm you up to the idea that oh, that actually this does belong in the same family. And if I if I tell that a different story a different way, I can actually make it sound like it belongs less, right? That it, well, what you've more. demonstrated is that the whole has an influence on each part of it. And so the whole song, as it were, the whole piece of music, the whole whatever you like to call it, has unfolding resonances with itself that suggest that it's already completed. Otherwise, one wouldn't understand where one was going in it. So No, because there's still you, the level. You've got to go from the top down as well as from the bottom up. That's right, but that's exactly that's exactly what happens in harmonics, right? So the lability of the song is that I can I can play you a, a note and another note which goes together, and then a sequence of notes which seem to go together, and then I can play you a repetition of that sequence uh, that obviously goes together because it's the same as the previous one. But I can also play you that same sequence that's a fifth up or a third down, or I can play a variation of that sequence, right? right? And those are, those are all. 
uh, utterances in the same language, but it doesn't, but they are all error correcting within their own frequency as well, right? It's, there are still big gaps in between them. Cool. I can't just play any old note and have, have that fit, right? And the, in the entire tuning of the entire key scale that I'm playing at still disallows most of, uh, of possible frequencies, but there's still an enormous language of possible songs that I can play. Unless you're a Stockhausen. But, but I mean, I don't, I don't know how you can get from this, which is a very, very wide ranging conception of relations. I think relations is very important, which is why I like your image of music. But I just want to sort of test it a bit. And it seems to me that like this, one has no sense of, you know, we, need, we mustn't get too far away from the formation of a frog skull or the formation of a human brain. Mm -hmm. In this, can you explain to me how this model that allows so many different variations in there either helps to perpetuate a form so that it is repeated in future or where the information is. I mean, in the case of Bach, it's obvious. I mean, there's a score, we open it, or we hear somebody play it, we, we, we're able to write it down like Mozart, and then we can play it. But, mm -hmm. but where is this? And it, it, has this actually added to the question, where is the information, and how is it repeated, and what is the memory of it? Mm -hmm. So I didn't explain the connection with the Cladney plates yet. So imagine that you are... Uh, instead of playing one vibration to a Cladney plate, you play a song, right? You play a combination of chords or a changing combination of chords over time. Mm. Uh, and now uh, for some particular special kinds of molecules that have that kind of uh, linear um, read, write, you know, tape like kind of um, behavior, if you're putting those vibrations onto a molecule whilst you're moving the read, write head across it, you're leaving those patterns along it as you go. And if those patterns next time you read it influence what you read, that they can be read rather than written, uh, then you have a way of recording a dynamical process into the sand, as it were, as you as you travel. And that's that's how I'm viewing the relationship between the behavior, shape, and form of the organism and the and the information that's in the DNA. That the sand is is not where the vibrate, where the it's not like a musical score of the vibrations no it's just, it's just a it's a it's a projection into a low dimensional space like the salt mm. is of the mode that's in that's in that's vibrating in the plate yes and i think that, it's, a, that, it's enough to influence it but it doesn't yes, it's not it's yes. not a code for it no i i, I like this i i I just think we've got a long way to go, but that's fine. I mean, this is this is a this is a, a I think a helpful step, but uh, it's still a very long way from helping answer. But that's okay. The questions with which I started. You know, another way to think about this, I I, I sometimes like to work backwards and ask myself, um, what what I know the answer if we, if we how will we know the answer if and when we find it? So what does what does the ideal situation look like? And this is this to me is very similar to the quest for uh, for a theory of consciousness, you know. So we look at the ones that have been put out, and and for each of them we can say, oh, but that's not that doesn't work. That's not what you know. That explains something else. It's you know neural correlates or behavior or physiology or something. That's not what we mean by consciousness. So so then so then eventually one says, okay, well, what would it take? Ne never mind what the situation is in the real world. Let's assume we can make up whatever we like. What you know? What would be a story that? would we would say ah now you see now you've cracked it right that's that's it that's that that's a that's a sort of i'll buy that as an answer right? whatever whatever that might be and i think it's very hard i think oftentimes certainly for consciousness i think it's very hard i think it's very hard to to think of what what a a theory would be where we would say well by golly that's that's you know that's it that that's it that answers my question i don't really see what what a coherent story about that would be that we would buy and no. for the shape, you know, for the shape of, uh, of course, this is very important. And I talk about this to, to the people in my lab all the time. It's like, what, what are we going for? What is the, you know, mm. uh, what, what does the final answer look like? And I think, you know, in keeping with my sort of the instrumentalist view on, on reality, I think what we are looking for then is a set of um, protocols, as it were, for making the shape be whatever you want. So, so I will say that you've got the answer to this question, if and only if I will say I want a frog with six legs and a propeller on top and, and, and you know, the, the tail like a, like a tiger. 
and you say to me, we can do that. And here's how you would do it. You, I will change this and that. And, and there you go. That's what you will get. And, and if they can do that, then I will say, well, by gum, then you must have found the the encoding, right? Because otherwise, but like, what what's better than that? I, I don't imagine why. I don't know what's better than that. So, you know, that's where. I, but but I'm open to other other views on this. What what does a solution to the what what does it do? You know what? Well, two things occur to me. I mean, one is to do with um, the the immediate analogy that you made of if we could have a frog with etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I I can understand how you could work experimentally within this complex system and find a way of intervening that caused it to have <laughs> six legs and a propeller or <laughs> whatever. But you still haven't, I think what I want to emphasize is that this isn't an answer to the question how the developing embryo knows how to further develop the frog skull and how when it's disturbed or you intervene in it, it says, I don't like this, I want to go back to a frog skull. But is that true? Do you think that, do you think that it's possible to get to the point of being able to have, being able to make any shape that you want biologically and not have answered that question? How, well, what else I, is I that? don't know about the technical aspect of whether you can make frog embryos do these things. You're the man to answer that. But what I'm saying is I'm not sure that this is, well, I don't think that this is the same um, as saying what we're doing, what you can report is what you've done in the lab and you interfered in this and that and the other. But this is slightly like my comparison between the hard and the soft problem of consciousness. You, you know, you said that, I mean, okay, Mark Soames can say, you know, and it's perfectly true, and I knew this when I was a medical student, that, you know, the reticular activating system is incredibly important for consciousness. And when people have a stroke that affects this area, they're not conscious. So, that, that's a different question from what is that consciousness. Is. And that, 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 bring, is. That, that brings me to the second thing, my reflection on what you just said, which is I think that that's absolutely fair. And I think what you're pointing to is the limits of a certain um, methodology or modeling or whatever, which is that it's satisfied if it can account for something within certain terms, but it's not satisfied or does it, or, or has to accept that it can't answer it, then it says, well, what would a real answer to this look like? Now, I think that's progress. I think that's good because I think the proper way to approach consciousness is to say we've tried every possible way we can to see how you can extract consciousness from entirely unconscious matter, if matter really and truly has nothing to do with consciousness. And that's a big question, because I believe that's not the case. But if that were the case, it, 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 there is no known way and probably no knowable way. So you're then moved forward, I think, to the position that I hold about consciousness, which is that it is an ontological primitive. It's not extracted from or emergent from anything else. It is what it is. There it is. And I think that what I'm saying about the forms in this respect is that they may be of a kind that the kind of science that you perfectly correctly and honorably are pursuing is not going to be able to give us an answer to where these forms are or what they are. So if that's the case, is it, is it reasonable enough to posit that there are such fields of form somewhere and that we may in the future come to know something about them, or we may actually never be able to locate them or say what they are. Yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on, on the, parenthetically, I'm with you on the consciousness bit. Um, and, and I also agree that these kind of loss of function experiments where you knock something out and it disappears, that's not remotely sufficient. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm in agreement on all that. Um, I think that what, you know, my, my um, counterfactual story is, was that if we had the, if we really had the ability, so I view it as a necessary condition that, that if we, in order to have the ability to make whatever kind of shape you want, I don't mean screw up a shape and say, oh, look, it's gone wrong. And I don't mean, you know, I don't mean that. I mean, literally, I tell you, I want this, uh, you know, this, this, this elephant in threefold symmetry with what, like, whatever, like literally complete control. I don't think you can get there without as much of an understanding of where form is encoded as there is to be had. I just, you know, that, that, that to me is the strongest criterion for being able to say, it's a little like, you know, someone could say, 
I know you got airplanes and gliders and rockets, but you still haven't understood flight, right? Like there's this, okay. you know, there's this, mm, there's this, 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 this essence of flight. And we, I, I just don't feel like we've got it yet. Right. Like, like, sure. Okay. You know, there's airplanes and whatnot. So I, I, you know, I don't know. Um, there may well be other things behind it. And, and, and I think, you know, I think our positions are not that different because I do, I do think that uh, somewhat similar to consciousness, some of this stuff is an ontological primitive in the way that uh, the truths of mathematics are. I mean, I really do have this, this Platonic view that, that some of these things are now that doesn't mean we can't explore them. In fact, I, I think yeah. that's exactly what we're doing in synthetic yeah. bioengineering and things like that is we're sort of getting a peep into that, into that world. Um, yes. I, 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 I'm glad that we're, we're, we're that close and I believe we are, but just to, if I may revert to the question whether we've really understood where forms are and how they operate, if we can change um, change to the elephant that has 17 trunks or whatever it is we particularly want. Um, <clears throat> I think the thing is this, you could say, well, in this particular sequence of amino acids, I've done certain changes and I've manipulated that and so on. And, and, and you've therefore got an account of a narrative of what you did. But can is that the same as saying to me, I now know how... Um, how this information works, because what you're saying is, I have a handle on a proxy for it that I can shift, but what is it that I'm actually shifting? Yeah. But if I didn't, how would I have known which, which knob to twist, right? I mean, you can, you can pick some low-hanging fruit without knowing what you're doing, for sure, right? And you mm. can make some things that's, you know, you mm. can fumble around, but, mm. but, but to really, you know, I'm sort of asking for past that, right? To really have complete control, I don't, I don't think you can do that without... A proper understanding of of where the encoding is, otherwise you wouldn't get. And in fa and in fact, what what you just laid out is is basically the the reason why the technologies like um, CRISPR and genomic editing and this kind of stuff. This is why I don't think they're the fundamental solution to regenerative medicine because they're going to get stuck exactly where you just said. So yeah, you can pick some low hanging fruit about well, I can, I know some things I can twist and get, but you will get nowhere near a complete complete control over, over, over mesoscale properties, the things we really care about, you know, fingers and eyes and so on um, with that approach. Um, I don't want to take up all the time. I think Richard's got his mm. thing queued up. Um, sure. Uh, so I, I, thanks. I don't, I mean, I don't know if this will resonate with you or not, but resonance mm. is the idea. Uh, so I'll just share my screen for a second, just to show you uh, this figure. So this is this is a wave, a one-dimensional wave through time, if you like. Uh, can you see that okay? Yes, yes. Uh, it's um, If I zoom in on it, you can see there's um, quite a bit more structure here than you might guess. Yes. At first. So within these... Yes. Within these blobs there, you know, when you get close enough, it is just an oscillation, right? Yes, yes. And it's not, it's not built in any programmatic way. It's just a, a combination of, you know, cosine to the fourth plus sine squared plus, you know, that sort of, you know, sine of two X and that kind of stuff all, all added up together to make a whole, a bunch of, uh, just to make a complicated looking wave. Um, and um, you can see that there's a sort of a, I, I summed things which were harmonic so that they, there's a macro scale wave structure to the whole thing as well. You, this repeating blob, mm. slightly different each time. And within that three repeating blobs and so on. And within it, you mm. zoom down and you get more and more detail. Yep. Now I want to show you what that one dimensional wave looks like when you render it in two dimensions by taking the X coordinate to be every 13th, um, uh, Y position, and then the Y coordinate to be every uh, 14th um, Y position. So that they slip slightly with respect to one another as the reading frame slips, the reading frames for the X value and the Y value are going at slightly different paces as you move along this uh, song. And the result of that is the link which I put in the chat, uh, because if I try to just play the video, experience suggests that... Um, okay. That won't work. So I put the link in the chat so that you Thank can you. download it and play it. Play it. Thank you very much. Yes, I'd like to. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I, I don't know how to get rid of chat now. Oh, there it's gone. <laughs> um, 
uh, we're probably approaching an end, but I, I, I think there's something very important that we're touching on here that perhaps we, it would be fruitful to think more about and talk more about. But it's really the question whether if you know how to control something, you understand it. And it seems to me that this is a fundamental problem in our culture, is that we believe that because we've found ways of understanding, of sort of, of controlling something, we actually under, understand what it is we're doing and what it is that we're dealing with. And I think this is, a, is, is part of what we're coming to here, is that it's like the story of the, you know, the, the, the sorcerer's apprentice who, who knows how to utter the spell and knows that certain things will happen, but doesn't really understand what he's doing at all. <laughs> and <clears throat> so I, I just want to keep that distinction between the sense of understanding something that knows that if I intervene in this way, certain things will predictably happen, and the kind of understanding that I'm really talking about, which is behind that above it or on a meta level from that which is what is actually yeah. what are we dealing with here which is a philosophical question and I know that you know in certain scientists minds that's the kind of way of saying not important but I don't think so at all I mean I think science and metaphysics have to walk hand in hand and science is wrong to discard metaphysics and metaphysics is wrong to disregard science yeah. yeah I no, I, I agree 100% in the way that uh, the way that I think about this is the type of engineering that we were just talking about, where where you make your you know threefold elephant or whatever, I, I view that kind of control engineering as a narrow part of what I what's really meant, which maybe generalizes as relationship. So, mm. so right mm. because because across that agential spectrum, you know, on the left side you've got some some mechanical clocks and some things like this, where the, the only relationship you're going to have is to rewire the thing, and that's it, right? But on the right side, you have systems where to really understand them and to really have that kind of relationship, it's not all of it's. In fact, it's largely not about control going in one direction. It's a bi-directional, you know, you're going to um, benefit from their agency. You're going to form some sort of, uh, you know, exactly. together unit, right? And, and the kind of thing that I'm talking about is somewhere in the middle where, uh, at least for the, for the biology, uh, I, that, that is also a bi-directional relationship and truly understanding it, it is not enough to just, you know, sort of create some stuff and say, see, I made as many trunks as you want. You know, it, it's it, right. I, I, I agree with you that I think it's all part of, you know, to, to really understand something, there's more to it than just the unidirectional control, right? There's also yes, kind yes. of a wider, but, 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 in the, but, but I do see it as one continuum. So it's almost yeah. like, yes. you know, it, it, it's, it's like engineering on steroids, so to speak, that at some point it's not just you tweaking the system. It's some kind yes. of dance uh, yes. thing that by which both systems benefit and sort of scale up and all that kind of thing. Yes, and, and one interesting consequence of that is if you believe, as I do, that all relationships are reciprocal or reverberative or however you like to put mm -hmm. it, there is no such thing as an interaction in which only one party has changed. Yeah. Then we come to the interesting um, point where the nature of our intervention affects what it is that we're going to find and what we find affects mm -hmm. the nature of what it is we think we've seen and what we next do. So it's just worth always remembering that, that the, 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 the model or the dynamic that we are pursuing and we think that we understand this as, uh, as helpful may well be helpful, but it's only a partial help and it may deceive us and it's an adjunct on a process where we have to keep revisiting our model and what I'm pleading for really is a less mechanical model because mm. I don't know where the mechanism is and I'm not sure that anyone does where this phenomenally complex three-dimensional material is so exquisitely preserved and it if we have to go outside of a, a view of mechanism as we've had to do in physics I think it's, it's, it's no shame if biology also has to recognize this. It may cause a revolution in biology as the findings of quantum mechanics formed a revolution in physics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> well, that's actually uh, the hour. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good. Shall we do the usual thing of finding another slot by email? I think it works best. Is that okay? That. Yeah. yeah, that's fine. Yeah. That sounds great. Good, good. 
Thank you very much. Very good. Very Both good. Yeah. Good Thank to you. see you. Nice to see you. Yeah. yeah. Lots to think about. Thank Absolutely. you very much. Yeah. yeah. See you soon. See you soon. Bye.